Shalom, shalom, Israel. <clears throat> Most high Christ bless y'all. Let's give it another minute or so. Shalom, Sister Mara. <laughs> All praises. All right, all right. I'm going to get started. <clears throat> Shalom, Israel, Most High Christ. Bless y'all. <clears throat> I'll praise to the Most High Christ for another day. Um, so, uh, obviously, we just coming off the quest. Those who uh, know, um, this was my first quest, not my first cruise, but first quest. And, you know, a lot of thoughts and everything ruminating around. Um, you know, there will be commentary coming out. They did a nice kind of... Uh, uh, I guess what would you call it, like a roundtable discussion with thoughts from the captains. Uh, you got some good stuff from the leaders, uh, the senior leadership of the deacons and the bishops, um, you know, and their thoughts and commentary on that. And that'll all be dropping with the documentary, et cetera. And, you know, we had a class on Friday night on the ship. Uh, it was like a men's class. And uh, a lot of good scriptures came out, um, you know, from the leaders and, uh, you know, it got me thinking, and as I was preparing the class uh, here for today, um, I kind of wanted to speak a little bit motivated by some of the things that they here brought out, and then, you know, kind of, um, you know, how the Spirit moved me to, to, to look at some of this. So, uh, with that being said, uh, the title of today's class, Witnesses of the Lord, a um, little bit of thoughts on the quest and, and, and kind of what we saw there. And, and really, it's just the power of what we were able to accomplish, how focused all these men were in, in being in, in this setting and, and hitting these countries. Um, I mean, it, it was work. It was work. We were, you know, we were, I don't want to say tired. I mean, we were zealous to do the work. But, um, you know, some people see sunshine and, you know, cruise ships, and, and I'm sure thoughts go through people's heads of, um you know, what's what. And uh, it's a very tight agenda and we kept very focused. And, um, you know, while we had some obviously creature comforts of the cruise ship when we were not um, out there teaching the people, it was very much <clears throat> a mission focused on a quest to wake up the tribes. So we're going to start with Isaiah 43 and 1. <clears throat> In Isaiah 43 and 1, it says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So we understand the subject matter here is dealing with Israel and Jacob. Because you have a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses that they like to use these verses uh, to justify their denomination and what's going on here. Uh, understand this is pertaining to Israel only. And it's about the redemption of God's people, the greatest nation that there is, the greatest nation that ever was, the greatest nation that ever will be. And he says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Meaning Israel would not be destroyed forever, you know, and we're passing through the waters. You know, we were on this ship in the middle of the ocean. And, you know, there was a brother that had posted, man, I think the brother's name was Benaya, a soldier. I'm not sure what camp he's from or whatnot. Um, and, you know, he had made a heavy statement and he said, what's crazy is that, you know, in the same way we were brought into captivity, we're using that same thing with ships and we're out there 
preaching the word. We're out there bringing this word of redemption to Israel. And, and this is the thing that kind of impressed upon me the whole time. And, and, and I'll speak a little bit about it, you know, as the spirit moves me more was for the most part, how receptive these people were, how thirsty and hungry they were for this word. And, you know, that opens up a whole nother avenue of thought because, you know, you see how I've always said like here in America, as much as we talk about poverty and captivity, poverty here is not poverty like it is in these other countries. Uh, captivity here is not like captivity over there. Don't get me wrong. We, we, we're not, you know, it's not exactly a bed of roses here for us. That's evident. Um, but, you know, we benefit. I, I've, I've said this before, people who've seen some of my classes. Those of us here in, in the United States, we're the house Negroes. You know, we get to sleep, you know, in Master's house. Um, our people out there, it's another story. And, and, you know, when the scripture talks about, you know, in their affliction, they'll seek me early. Uh, they're very much like that out there, you know? I mean, yeah, they have a happy life. They make the best of it with what they have, but they really see those conditions and, and the way the word was received by people out there, um, by us, um, especially Northern Kingdom, right? Northern Kingdom has obviously its negative reputation, rightly so, scripturally, historically, silly doves. Uh, but to see the reception that we got from Northern Kingdom out there was, was um, out of this world. Still not the level of what I experienced in Cuba, but very few scoffers, very many people that were were astounded um, at, at what was being brought out. So I'm going to read on, and it says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Understanding that the kingdom of heaven is us being in rulership. The Lord said he's going to give men for, for us and people for our life. So you got people out there talking about all oh, the message that 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 we're bringing out the true understanding of the scriptures. Uh, it's it's not good. It's racist. It's this that and the other. The Lord said, "I love you so much that I give people for thee. I give men for thee and people for thee." And He says, "Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back." Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. This is a call to Israel in the four corners of the earth. It, you know, years ago, I, I, I couldn't fathom when I first started repenting, you know, and, and I'm learning from, from the bishop and, and these deacons and, you know, these, these men. And, and you see the vision narrowly. And what I mean by that is, you're so caught up in the understanding and you're awed by what you need to do in your walk in repentance that you don't understand the great magnitude of what we've been called to do. And in the timing that we've been called to do it, remember that part as well. And, 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 and I'll expound upon that as I go on. And the vision of, of us being scattered into the four corners of the earth, like the scripture speaks about, the scripture here tells you we need to be called from everywhere. And who is going to do that call? A lot of these countries don't have internet. A lot of these uh, countries don't have the means to watch the online class like we do, like you do right now. They're not fortunate enough like that. Yeah, sure, the world is getting smaller, so to speak, right? Uh, more people are getting access to things. But what we take for granted, going back to, to what I'm saying, how the differences between us here in America and what you see in these other countries, um, what we take for granted you know, they don't have, you know, you've heard like the term first world problems, you know, oh, my AC's broke, this, that, or whatever. AC what? They ain't got no AC over there. You know, they got zinc roofs and they ain't got no glass in the windows, like a window cutout, no glass, you know? And um, they're not, they don't have these means. So it's a different type of ministry when we go out on these trips to build these people up. And it's a lot more challenging in what we have to do. And the scripture here, when, when you read this in Isaiah, it's letting you know, hey, Israel is everywhere. He said, I'm going to bring them from the east, from the west, from the north. I'm going to say, give them up from the south. I'm going to say, keep not them back. So that you understand we are scattered in the four corners of the earth. And it says, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And make no mistake upon it, while we are the vessels that are being used to bring this word out, that are taking these quests to wake up the 12 tribes. 
it's very, very important that we understand that it's the Lord that puts you in that position. It's the Lord that gives you that dispensation of the gospel. All of us, right? All of us as different teachers, we have different measures of understanding, different ways that we look at things, but it's still all one spirit. And when I say different, it's not different doctrines. That's what I mean by it's all one spirit. Some teachers are one way, some are another. Some, some have the gift of tongues and being able to speak different languages and bring it out in that way. And then some have a different spirit to be evangelists. Like you read in the scriptures, some evangelists, some teachers, right? Some pastors, some have multiples of gifts, but it's all granted of the Lord. But one thing that is constant is that we must go and gather them and, and, and be those vessels to redeem our people from all the four corners of the earth. And four corners is dealing when you deal with that compass, right? There's four positions that they speak on, north, south, east, west everywhere that Israel is. And it says, bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. The blind that have eyes, letting you know, they're not going to be blind physically. They're not going to be deaf physically. All right. Spiritually, they're blind. Spiritually, they're deaf. It says, bring forth those blind that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Also letting you know that though they're blind and though they're deaf, they're going to see their teachers. They're going to hear their teachers. And they're going to hear this gospel like it's never been preached in the earth before. We, I'm, I'm telling you, we may, you know, yes, the Bahamas, the brothers had been there before. Maybe that was one stop where the gospel had been preached. We actually have a camp there. But uh, Roatan Honduras, no, never. The word, the word hasn't been preached there. And, and who knows if ever, you know, uh, when, when, when the tribes first got here, maybe for a dispensation of time but not anymore, right? These parts of Mexico that we were in, because while the stop may have been Costa Maya, while the stop may have been Cozumel, uh, man, what was it? When we were in Costa Maya, well, we were on a bus for two hours. You want to talk about, we weren't in no tourist areas, all right? We were going deep into the hoods of where our people were at, all right? We, there was no Americans in the places where we were going, you know? We were the ones that were there. And they were in awe seeing us with the uniforms and whatever. They didn't know what the hell was going on at first. People was coming out their houses. They, oh, we want to take pictures with you, you know? So it was, it, was, it was very surreal because there was a time when the bishop had gave a class called Fame in Israel. And I was like, wow, these people don't realize like, like what they've seen and what they're witnessing and, and, and the space for repentance that's being given to them. By, by the real prophets of the Most High being here and bringing this message out. So it says, bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. And then it says, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Why does it say all the nations? It's not talking about every nation, the Gentile nations, Ammon, Esau, all right, uh, um, Moab. It's not talking about Ishmael. It's not talking about that because of what we read earlier, that Israel would be scattered everywhere. We understand via the curses that Israel is everywhere. And he says, so bring forth all those nations, bring forth those blind people that have eyes, those deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. And what do they do? They come and they assemble as we're in camp, as we're bringing these word out. My thoughts on the quest is that I saw prophecy being fulfilled as we went out and did this work. And it's not just via the quest. We've done this. We do this. We travel internationally with the Booster Club. But y'all witnessed this through the power of, 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 of the internet and what have you. Y'all saw videos. Y'all saw live videos. Y'all saw photos. You're going to see the documentary. We're living in prophetic times. And if that's not something that builds your faith up, if that's not something that makes you more motivated, right, to seek the Lord 10 times more, I don't know what is. I don't know where your spirit's at yet. Maybe it's not awakened to that level yet. But understand and impress upon you that <laughs> the quest and all these trips that we take is what, is what you're witnessing is this prophecy being fulfilled. And it says, and let the nation and who among them uh, and let the people be assembled. And who among them can declare this and show us former things? Who can declare all these things about Israel that only we can with this proper understanding that's in the earth today? It says, who among those blind that have eyes and those deaf that have ears of our people who are scattered, calling themselves Mexicans, Honduranos, all these different things, all right? It says, who among them can declare this and show us former things? Who can show us our history? Who can go back and say, hey, you know, uh, your history is more than what happens uh, before the conquistadors arrive. Your history is before slavery. Your history is not that of the Egyptians. Your history is greater than that and further than that. None of them can. 
And that's a common question I love to ask when we're out there teaching Northern Kingdom. What was your history before that? Very few, a small amount can look and, you know, they might tell you the name of, of, of what it was when they were native or whatever, but it's not as far back as what the Bible says. And, and that journey that Second Ezra speaks about and what the scripture says we are called by the Most High and what's required of us. It says, who among these nations that are assembled which is dealing with our people that are scattered, can, can declare and show us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. And it says, and if they can declare these former things, if they can give us a reason as to why we went into captivity and what we need to do to get out of it and what's required of us of the Lord, and show us the power and magnification of what it means to keep the, the, the commandments in the faith of Christ, it says, then bring them forth. And he calls those people, if they exist, and they don't, all right? You might have a scoffer that thinks he does. And he calls those people witnesses. And he says, let them be justified. Because if you're going to profess something, if you're going to attempt to prophesy something, if you're going to say you have some level of understanding, he says, you need to justify your cause. You need to prove all things. He says, and if they can't, shh, let them hear and say it is truth. Because if they don't have another answer, then you have to go with what's coming out. Because the Lord's word is right, right? The scripture says, let, let God be true and every man a liar. So now, hold this. We're going to keep coming back to Isaiah quite a bit. I want to go to Matthew 28 and 19. Matthew 28 and 19, right? Because we read, and he says, let all nations be gathered together. <clears throat> So I want you to understand something. This is no different than what Christ was saying. And you're reading this in the time of Isaiah. This is Matthew 28 and 19. And he says, go ye therefore, this is Christ, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> this goes back to what I was saying for me early in my repentance. And I think a, a lot of brothers and sisters probably similarly, the magnitude of what this means is being made manifest today with these trips that we take, with these journeys that we take. You know, I was reading an article uh, just this morning as I'm getting ready, and I'm reading how, uh, it, uh, I think it was Kenya, and there was like a hotel attack. I mean, there's a, up, and they said upscale. This is like a tourist area, whatever you would think, where, where stuff like this wouldn't hit. And there was like a terrorist attack there. Some people got killed or whatever. And my mind couldn't help but go to our leaders that, that journey into the different parts of Africa, the, the diaspora where our people are to teach. And just because, I think we often also take for granted that just because they go and they come back okay and the Lord protected them because, right, this is by the Lord's grace that they're doing this. I think we take for granted the hazarding of their life that they do. It's hazarding of their life. And I think, you know, in the round table, one of the captains brought that scripture out. You know, it's like, you know, we're on this quest and, and, I mean, I didn't see fear in any brother's eye. We were just motivated and focused. But again, we were not in any, we weren't in tourist areas, man. Like we went, I know when we went to Honduras, man, the bus was taking us some places and we jumped into one spot and I was like, me and Amaziah was together. And we're like, ah, and you know, this camp spot, I don't think it looks too good. I asked the driver, hey man, where can we go? He said, oh, well, if you want to go in, we go in. I was like, yeah, let's go in. He's like, you sure? I mean, go further into the island. He was like, yo, I'm going to take you. He goes, people are going to come out. He was like, yeah, he said, people are going to come out their houses, you're going to see. And we and said, all right, let's go. And we went, boom, right in deeper into where we're at. And, and this was the case in most places. I mean, uh, the brothers did an excellent job with the quest in general as far as picking out camp spots and stuff like that. But in this particular instance, there's one spot. It's just like, ah, it looked a little dead. The spirit led us somewhere else. The point that I'm making is that don't take lightly that just because the Lord preserves those of us who are out there teaching, that doesn't mean that we're not going into something treacherous and dangerous, all right? And it's only by the grace of God that that we're able to do this and bring this back. I mean, it's a very controversial message when you think about it, you know? We out there breaking down strongholds that people hold on to dearly. And I know some of y'all know, especially Northern Kingdom, especially when it comes to that image, that Christianity, Roman Catholicism is a big thing out there in Central South America as well. Um, some people will fight, will fight you for that. They'll kill you for that. But it goes back and I thought about Africa and I thought about everywhere we go. And it says, go, so back to Matthew 20 and 19, Christ said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It says, teaching them, 
right? So this is what you understand what baptism is. It says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And this is why we can go so boldly into these places and preach what we preach and prophesy what we prophesy and give that understanding of the former things and what's to come as God's chosen witnesses is because we have Christ with us. The spirit of Christ is with us as we bring this word out. So he says, go teach all nations. Why? Real quick, Deuteronomy 4, 27. Don't forget this part. This is why we go out and minister, right? Because Christianity, they've been doing that for years. They go on mission. They go to these third world countries. They go to other places to bring the lie of Christianity, right? We're out here bringing the truth, right? The redemption of our people, like we read in the beginning of Isaiah 43. So Deuteronomy 4 and 27. This is why Christ said, go teach all nations. This is why Isaiah said, gather, assemble them of all nations. It says, and the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. And you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And at one time we were few when the first scattering happened, but now we're more abundant. But we are still scattered among the nations. This is why Christ said, go out and teach all nations. This is why Isaiah 43 and 9 said, let all nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Not that this message needs to be preached to the whole world as a physical thing, but to the whole world of Israel. And those of you who are in this walk and repenting, you understand this and impress upon you. And this is why we must go and do this. This is why you're seeing prophecy be fulfilled. We have a greater and stronger calling than just sitting behind a computer on the internet. We have multiple approaches into how we do this. Yes, we bring these classes via the internet, videos, all the different mediums, radio. We're out here on the quest. We're on radio shows. We're uh, uh, TV interviews. We had opportunity on the fly to do interviews with, with, with news in the street. You saw Bahamas. There's another one that happened in uh, uh, Honduras. They said that that program, it, it broadcasts even to Belize. Um, you saw us, uh, opportunity. There was a, a school, like a, like a, not a school, like a academic, you know, kindergarten through eighth grade, whatever, but it was like a, a school to learn English. And, you know, some kids were out there playing soccer and, you know, brothers went up and started speaking to them and the guy was interested and he said, come down, I want you to teach the kids, you know, and, and, and brothers went down there and taught them in Spanish. The, these kids, they stopped playing the, the games that they were playing and they sat there in the bleachers in awe, listening to this word, astounded, marveling at what was coming out because stuff like this has never come out to them. You want to talk about hope for the prisoners? This is the difference between us here in America. This is why you get so much more scoffers. We got the illusion of inclusion on our people out here. Out there, there was a message of hope being preached to these brothers and sisters, right? Give me Mark 16 and 15. Watch Mark 16 and 15. The book of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world. Same thing like he said in Matthew, same thing like we're reading in Isaiah. Instead of the nations, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not for us to determine who's what, whether they're of the tribes or not. We just go to where we understand our people are scattered and we're going to go ahead and bring this gospel of understanding. And if it be the Lord's will, this is why I said they're either going to justify, bring forth their witnesses, bring forth their cause and justify their action. Right? This is like when we say, show me where Christ is white in the Bible. And if they can't, and we know they can't, right? We know they can't. And if they can't, you have to hold your peace and accept what I'm showing you. Because if the Bible speaks, then the Bible is the authority. Understand that and believe that. Yet that's where the measure of faith comes in, because you either believe what the Bible says, black and white, plain in writing, or you're going to go against it and believe what you can't justify. And this is why in Isaiah said, bring forth your witnesses that they may be justified, or if not, shh, let them hear and say it's truth. Yeah, you're right. It has to be true. So it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because we are scattered. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And this is the same thing like we're reading where it says they're either going to bring forth their cause or they need to hear it and say it's truth. The scripture says some are reserved for, for good things and some are reserved for judgment. He says they are going to believe it 
and be baptized and be saved or, or not believe it and shall be damned. But believe is what? We understand that we're teaching actions behind that as well. Let's go to Acts 2 and 38. So there is no confusion. The book of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Repent, repent. Repentance is that baptism, right? That's uh, Psalms 19 and 7. Keeping the laws, how can a young man change his way? All right. It says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost because you can't say that you're going to repent and then resist the law. Like you read in Acts 7, it says you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Right. By angels, by messengers, you come with these scriptures and people don't want to keep them. Right. So it says, repay, Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. If you repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the promise to Israel everywhere. It says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. This is that four corners. This is coming from the north, the east, the south, the west. This is why we must go into all nations. This is why Marcus says, go into the whole world. It says, this promise of remission of sins of Jesus Christ, as long as we repent and have faith in him as Israelites, he says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That one third, we understand the fraction, we know the percentage, but the actual number, we don't know. It says, even as many as to God says are called. And it's not our job to determine the number, or the only number we're focused on is the 144. And we know it starts with that and 12 from each tribe. But even in that, we're going to continue to move forward. We don't go ahead and say, oh, we know we got the 12 here and we know we got the 12 there. We must work tirelessly. Our spirit must not rest in pushing this truth forth in the earth, right? And it says, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. You want to talk about Acts of the Apostle. This is the same message that we are preaching when we're out there. This is the same message I witnessed. And, uh, and, uh, and 100 or 150 men, I know it was like almost 300 people total, some were sisters, but we had over uh, 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 100 some odd men that were going out each day in these camps. They were witness to this of what we were doing. And it says, and with many words did he testify, and not our words, but with the words of these scriptures. That's key. That's what's important, that it's not our own voice that's speaking, but these scriptures. And it said, with many other words did he testify and exhort. This is that hope that we were bringing to those people, letting them know you're not a base people. You're not the lowest of the low. You're not what the world sees you as. In Mexico, we were banging hard on what how America's seeing them over here, how they're trying to keep them out, talking all this smack. Everywhere we went, we were bringing them up. And it says, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Pull yourselves out of this wickedness. When we see sisters with pants and tight stuff, because it reaches out there too, right? Sister, you shouldn't be that way, right? Brother, you shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be worshiping a white Jesus. You shouldn't be praying to crosses. You need to come together in these commandments. This is what was being preached out there. It says, verse 41, then they that gladly received this word were baptized. You are only baptized if you receive the word. Did they say the day that gladly received water? No. It says they that gladly received the word because why? We know it's repentance. In the faith of Christ, that's the baptism. He says they were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And steadfastly means like consistently, firmly. And this is what we're attempting to do as we go out. And don't just think we're hitting these places to drop this knowledge and then that's it. And that's the end of it. We have a formula as an organized body that we are right? That we're going to go and we're going to say, okay, uh, I'm going to tell you, for example, one of the tactics that we do when we're in places where we don't necessarily have connections or contacts. And one of the things we do is we'll take a notebook and people who are interested, we have a brother going out and saying, give me your number. If you have an email, give me your email. And guess what we're doing? 
We're organizing that information and we're going to call these people back that stayed, that listened for the hours that we were there, that you could see that the spirit was in them to receive this word. And that's how you start to plant roots. That's how you start to build little sanctuaries in all these countries where our people are to build them up. And what do we have? We have a formula for success through trial and error, through guidance in the scriptures, through experience, through exercise of use of seasoned men that we can actually say, because sometimes we get that question. So what now? You were here from a ship. You're here one day. Is that it? Are you going to tell us this and not give us anything else? And oh, see here it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a time where men are going to be, it's, you want to talk about acts of the apostles. You understand what that means? The apostles would, would, would sojourn months, weeks, months, years in some cities and some countries to help build and establish churches. That's the future of what you see, Lord will live last, here in IUIC as what we do, as what Israel does out there. You're going to be asked, men, to go ahead and spend a season and a long season in these countries to establish order and structure and the Most High's will in these little sanctuaries to build things up. We're going to say, brother, we need you to stay in Honduras for three months. Brother, we need you to stay in Africa for four months. Brother, you have to move to this part of Central and South America, uh, maybe for a year, maybe for longer, to make sure that when we leave, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, teaching them and instructing them and guiding them in all of that. Because we know Satan's devices. We understand via Mark 4 that we have to make sure that root has been taken in these places, not just sow seed and then never come back and check it. We have to make sure that root has been taken in these places so that the laws will be done. And we've established something and you've begun the beginnings of a foundation. And that's what you're seeing. These are the beginning phases of it. Years ago, when I first repented, I, I mean, I knew what was required, but I, I, until you see it, Sometimes you can't really fathom it or grasp it. You have your thoughts, you have your mind. Uh, the, the brain is just, is just funny like that. And now you're seeing that evidence. And even those of you who didn't go, this is, uh, th these things, when you see these men out there teaching and prophesying and bringing this to, to all the four corners of the world, uh, understand, I mean, and it's not just these scriptures. I mean, I, I could have gone on and on with this class, right? But you got to understand that. All the scriptures talks of this is prophecy being fulfilled. We speak of prophecy being fulfilled. That should increase your faith as you see this thing. Um, and it says, and fear came upon every soul, where verse 43 in Acts, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, in this time, we, you know, in that time, we understood the apostles had actual real spiritual power as far as laying of hands and things like that. Our spiritual power comes in the power of the scriptures. And you want to know what these signs and wonders are? When I see a gang member say he's not going to be in a gang anymore. When I see a man, when the law on the, the, not covering your head come out, take his hat off. When I see idols come off people's necks. When I see people showing forth the actions of repentance, right? Because it's action driven. All right. These are signs and wonders and the powers of the spirit that we see there. All right. Let's get first Peter's three and 21. First Peter 3, 21. Again, dealing with the baptism. So you understand, right? Because we read baptized. I just want to put this little note there. It says, the like figure whereunto baptism does also now save us. Baptism is the repentance and receiving of Christ as the Savior of Israel only. All right? The black Messiah. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The good conscience toward God is that love. If you love me, keep my commandments, the action that comes behind that. And this is what we're teaching when we're out there. We're teaching that repentance. And I got to tell you something. I don't know, maybe some of the other camps that came up, the actual topic of water baptism was, was not a big thing that I noticed out there. I mean, they received the word. You want to talk about the image of Christ? Um, almost everybody, not a problem. Yep. Christ is black. Hey, you read it. It makes sense. Right. I, I don't know if it's the effect or the strength of the words in Spanish. I know I know when we were in the Spanish countries, maybe it's just the English language and, and the fact that there's so many synonyms for different words um, that, you know, I mean, we know it's so spiritual that you get people buck up. But I mean, boom, you say bronce brunido. That's it. They're like, yup, that's brown. Yup. Oh, it's in an oven. That's black. 
Oh, okay, yeah, you know what? Half like a sheep, yep. Bello Chino, yeah, that's 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 an afro. Yeah. Like, oh snap. Wow, you're right. Yeah, there was a couple. Don't get me wrong, there was a couple that came to scoff against that. All right. Uh let's go back to Mark. All right. Let's read that again. Uh Mark 16, 15. And it says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized, and we understand that that's repentance and faith in the black Messiah Christ, and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth shall not be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Again, in this time, I have mentioned it already, the apostles had that spiritual power to literally exercise demons. We do have power over unclean spirits in this day, and it's in the keeping of these commandments. You see these devils come out of people. It's the devil of the different lust, the devil of covetousness, the murderous spirit that's in our brothers and sisters. You see these devils be cast out when people come out of these lifestyles and put off the former person, put off the old man or the old woman and move forth in repentance. So you see that, and it says, and they shall speak with new tongues. You wanna know what new tongues is? It's not the ha, blah, 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 blah. No, it's not that. New tongues, Spanish was not a language during this time. That's a new tongue in the earth. Creole, English, as I'm speaking to you in English. English was not a language at this time. There was nobody speaking what we call English today at this time. New tongues, prophecy being fulfilled. They said, you're going to go out into the world because Christ saw the future. He knew it all. And he said, you're going to go out and you are going to speak in new tongues. You're going to speak in the languages of those times, the languages of our oppressors, and you are going to bring forth this understanding and my word will be magnified. Let's go to Isaiah 28 and 9. Prophecy being fulfilled. That's what I saw when I was on the quest. I saw prophecy being fulfilled before my eyes. Isaiah 28. And all praises that I was able to be a part of that. All praises to the most high. I don't know how many more quests I'm going to be able to go on or what's going to happen. I don't know talking about. Yeah, I'm going every year. I don't know. I'll see how the spirit moves me. I hadn't gone on any of them. I had been invited. There was a way for me to go. I don't know. Just different things. Stuff came up. Uh, I was talking with Captain Mattathias. He says, bro, if there's ever one that you come on, he goes, this is the one. He goes, we got three Northern Kingdom stops. We could use you, you know? And, um, you know, I said, all right, man. I said, I'm there. I'm there. And I got to tell you something. I think there was maybe, you want to talk about how much work we got done in three uh, uh, so-called Latin countries. There was only 17 of us that spoke Spanish. And some of us not so good. I'm, I'm, I go on record. I say, I'm, I'm not the best. Uh, when I'm in the spirit, the Lord gives me understanding and I flow and and and, and I can do it. Um, but only 17 of us out of the hundreds that that, that were there uh, to go and preach this. And and uh, man, I'm, I'm so proud of these Northern Kingdom brothers that were there, man. I was impressed by some brothers. I was reinforced by some brothers that were bringing this thing out. And I pray they all endure, man. And you know, it just... Everybody knows what was going on over the past couple months. In light of all this stuff, man, and I saw the unity. Oh, man, and, and my Southern Kingdom brothers, hey, some of y'all brothers tried to read in Spanish for us, so all praises for that, all right, putting in that effort. The conviction I saw in these men's eyes to, to put that mission forward, right? Because you know Northern Kingdom always deal with it. Listen, I see sometimes the comments when I'm here. People look at me, they see I'm light-skinned, right? Sometimes, sometimes you see a little bit of the, the redness coming out a little bit, right? And those who don't understand, and I don't pay it no mind, right? These scoffers that are there. I see y'all brothers and sisters, some of y'all try to defend us and all that stuff like that. But it's it's very nice to see how we were unified there. I mean, you saw that speckled bird as we were out there. You saw my Southern Kingdom brothers. Some of them were like, yo, I'm, I'm reading Spanish. I'm trying to learn. Hey, we said Southern Kingdom brothers. Remember, there was only 17 Spanish teachers. So I had to send non-Spanish speaking brothers out into the freaking hoods of Honduras and Mexico two by two with flyers to gather in more people and told them, hey, the camp's down there. And we just gave them a few things, you know, preguntas, repuestas, whatever, you know, go down here and, and brothers, their spirit was willing, you know? So even them brothers, they were speaking in new tongues, maybe not fluently, and they were guiding people to us. I saw the power of the spirit jointly compacted together, like the scripture tells you, moving us forward in one accord and in unity, bringing this word out, bringing this word out. And I'm telling you, they hated us on the ship. I didn't even, I don't have time for that. You'll hear the stories, man. I mean, 
they, they were bold. They were brazen. It was a lot of Esau. There was Amalek straight telling us shit to the face. Part of my language. They were telling us stuff to the face. They was upset hearing little things underhand. It, we, we walking out by the hundreds to, to organize and walk out. Oh, it must be a free cruise. Some type of, but that's prophecy being fulfilled too. That's Deuteronomy 28, 37, Proverbs and bywords, right? So, so they might have not said nigga or spick openly, but they're under the assumption that you see all these black and Hispanic men and it had to be a free cruise. We didn't, we couldn't afford this, right? It had to be a free cruise that we were out there for. Hey, some thought we were musicians. They were like, hey, sing a song. <laughs> Football players, whatever, you know? But understood the prophets were there and people knew it. People saw it. All right. So let me go to Isaiah 28 and 9 because we were talking about Mark where it said new tongues, right? Isaiah 28 and 9. It says, so whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Who will the most high give that increase to? These brothers and sisters that we were out there preaching to on the quest, right? It says, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, giving them them little nuggets, that repentance, that baptism of repentance, and receiving the true understanding of the Holy Ghost. It says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And they had never seen the scriptures preached this way. They're used to their pastors in church. That's the other thing here in America. Some of our people are a little desensitized by Israelites, right? I know I grew up in New York. I saw them all the time in the city. Never really fully understood it until the most high, right? I was one of those blind that had eyes and deaf that had ears. And while I was aware of them, it wasn't until that exact point in time when the Lord had ordained for me to receive it, when he said, hey, I'm going to call you to do this, all right, that I was fully aware and I wasn't blind anymore and I wasn't deaf and I was able to hear and actually apply and repent. But it says, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, for with stammering lips, some some of them Southern Kingdom brothers that were, that were trying, all right, with stammering lips because they weren't too sure about what they were speaking, and with another tongue will he speak to this people. Just like we read in Mark, they said we will go out into the whole world and preach this gospel with new tongues to these people, with new tongues to teach these people. I'm going to tell you something. People want to know what the secret sauce is. This is the secret sauce right here. All right. Oh, why is IUIC doing the things that they do? How can they set these things up that way? The secret sauce. We're out there with new tongues, with another tongues, teaching the basics, teaching real repentance. It says drawn from the milk and weaned from the breast, telling them, hey, this is what you must apply. This is what your true nationality is. Let's go back to Isaiah 43. <clears throat> Isaiah 43 and 9 again. It says, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. And they won't because you can't gain say these scriptures. All right. It says, or let them hear and say it is truth. That's the only two options when this comes out. You, just got one, you either have some strong evidence that you can support your false claims, right? And we know they don't, or you're going to hear it and you, you got to say it's true. If you believe in the Bible, you got to say it's true, right? It says, who of them can show us? Isaiah 41 and 21. None of them can show you. And the scripture tells you that. So it's almost like a rhetorical question when it says for them to bring forth their witnesses. And I want you to understand that there's a difference between their witnesses and God's witnesses as us being out there bringing this word out. And it says, Isaiah 41 and 21 says, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. This is what it means when it says, bring forth their witnesses and let them be justified. It says, let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. So in verse 43 and nine, we read, who can talk about former things? This is the history that we bring them of captivity. All right. What the conquistadors did to them, what the, what our slave masters did to us. Right. But then it says, who can show us what shall happen? There is no understanding. There is no book on this earth. All right. No Dead Sea Scrolls, no Book of the Dead. Right. No Talmud, Tanakh that can tell you why our people are in the conditions that we're in, why we're hated like we're hated and what we need to do to get out of it and obtain salvation, except this proper understanding of the gospel of the scriptures, right? So it says, let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. They can't. Let them show the former things. They can't. What they be that we may consider them. 
If you got that understanding, show us so that we can consider them. This is why we can so boldly say out there, show me this in the Bible. I'll close the Bible. I'll follow you. Show me Jesus is white. Show me God is white. Show me the Israelites are white. Show me this. Show me that. Show me that I don't have to keep the laws. They can't. So it says, what they be that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare on us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that ye are gods. And that's heavy right there. Because it says, if you can show these things, if you can show the former, the latter, right? The what's to come, the things that come hereafter and prove it. The scripture says, then that means ye are gods. So a lot of times we think about gods and we think about the way we were, it, with, with, you know, like when the garden first formed and the authority and power. The scripture says ye are gods, but we'll die like men. These scriptures make us gods because we're able to tell, we're able to review the past and tell them their future. That's the power and authority that we have in these scriptures. And he says, if they're able to do that and we can consider that then they are gods, but they're not. So on the reverse, what does that mean? We're those gods in the earth today. Believe that. And that's the power and authority that we're bringing to people. And it says that we may know that ye are gods. It says, yea, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Do one or the other, but get the hell out the way because the real gods and the real prophets were out there bringing you that understanding. And that's what you saw on that trip. Yeah, free cruise, you saw gods, you were among gods. That's why that wisdom of Solomon 5, when it says they're going to look up in that day and say, these are them that we had in derision. Man, that's, that's an honor and, and uh, uh, a recompense that the Lord is going to allow us to feel and understand. So while it's frustrating, and I didn't even tell y'all the insult that we had at dinner one night from a freaking Amalekite and Israeli. Long story short, he comes up to us and says, hey, my name's Jacob. Uh, I'm from Israel. And he says, I am the only Israelite on board. The air came out the room in that dining room. Because them freaking imposters, them heathen, they don't call themselves Israelites. They say they're Israelis or Jews. He knew what he saw, and he tried to spit in our face. And he was dealt with. And we, didn't, we never went back to the main dining room after that. I'm telling you, like all of us, like, you know, you want to talk about like, you see a movie scene where the dining room's buzzing and everything like that, and everybody's eating. Yo, this dude said that and like all of us stopped, forks drop, everything. Listen, the scripture says we're gods and they're going to know that they were among gods in that day. And we're going to see that thing and we're going to have that honor and that glory to know. It's all right. This is their kingdom. That's how we're going to roll. All right. But they're going to see we are gods by the power and authority of these scriptures of what we're bringing out. Uh, so that was verse 23. Uh, it says, um, I want to jump to 26. It says, uh, verse 26, who have declared from the beginning that we may know and before time that we may say he is righteous. Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. Only God have declared this and he have shown it to us to bring to all the people all in the four corners of the earth. It says, the first shall say to Zion, behold, behold them, and I will give to Jerusalem one that bringeth good tidings, talking about the promise of Christ. For I beheld, and there was no man even among them, and there was no counselor that when I asked of them could answer a word. None of them have the answers. Guess what? By the power of the Most High in Christ, we do. We have that answers. All right? We have those answers. He says, uh... Behold, they are all vanity. All these other doctrines, everything that they bring out, that's all vanity. Their works are nothing. Their molten images are wind and confusion. The crosses, all this other stuff that they worship, and we were out there showing them all of this. Now, back to Isaiah 43 and verse 10. So now, if Isaiah 43 and 10, it says, contrary wise, in verse 9, we were speaking about their witnesses, and I went to great lengths to show you that their witnesses cannot do what we do. All right. It says, ye are my witnesses, you brothers and sisters that receive this word, that repent as Israelites. OK, it says, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord and my sermon servant whom I have chosen, who he has chosen. 
Each and every man that was on that trip was chosen by the Lord to bring that out. And any trips and anything that we do. And there's many more that will be called to do this type of work. There's many more. And it says, I have chosen that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed. Neither shall there be after me. We are the witnesses. We have been chosen. Watch this. John 15. The book of John 15. And 16. John 15 and 16. You have not chosen me. So we didn't choose to repent. You think you did. You think you heard this and, and it was you and that you made a decision. God woke it up inside of you. It says, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. This is why you'll have a friend or family that don't get it. They, God has not chosen them. And it don't mean ever, but not yet. Because remember, I said, there, there are some of us who were called to be his witnesses before others. And it's for a purpose. And there's an honor in that. There's a glory in that. Paul even tells you, as mighty as he was, he gave honor to those that were in Christ before him. The Lord puts together what he needs to perfectly jointly compacted so that each thing does what it does the diversities of gifts is another thing we spoke about uh during the men's class uh on the class on sabbath class on saturday on the ship so you know i had a lot of thoughts from the class that was coming out like i said and and and, and you know uh i didn't have the space and the time but i said you know what i said i need to, i'm, I'm going to use this platform and, and let brothers understand the magnitude of what they saw i know i know i saw everybody kind of you know, cheering us on and boosting us through this and being excited, but you have to understand what was witnessed. And each time that it happens, and it's not just the quest, but every trip that we take, each time that it happens, prophecy is being fulfilled. It says, ye have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. We operate. This is how, why we, this is what says ye are gods if you have this understanding, because the creator of everything that you see around you ordained you, brothers and sisters, that ye should go and bring forth fruit. We were chosen and ordained to bring forth fruit, which is what we read in the beginning of Isaiah 43, the gathering and the redemption of God's people. All right. It says, uh, and that your fruit should remain like we read in Acts, that you must remain steadfast in these scriptures and continue. They, they remain steadfast and continued in the apostles doctrine, breaking bread, fellowshipping, repenting. It says not just bring forth the fruit, but that the fruit should remain. It behooves us and it becomes upon us. We are ordained and ordered and commanded by God to not just go and preach this, but to set up order and structure and little sanctuaries everywhere we go. It says that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And he will continue to bless us as a body. He will continue to bless us individually so long as we stick to this formula. All right. It says that we must go and do this. Watch this. It says what he commanded us. He commanded us to not suffer sin upon our people. Watch this. We know this scripture. We know it from a point of applying it within ourselves. But there's also application of this and how we do it to those that are without. It says, walk with wisdom to those that are without the understanding of God, the scripture tells you. And that's what we're doing when we go out there. Leviticus 19 and 17. Leviticus 19 and 17. We just read in John, it says that go and do as I command you, right? Leviticus 19 and 17 commands us. It says, thou shall not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou should in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. That's what we're preaching when we go out there. That's the baptism. That's what Peter said, repent and be baptized. This is what we're commanded in John. These are the witnesses that we are. This is the type of witnesses that we are. God's witnesses, witnesses of the Lord. And he said that we should not hate thy brother in thy heart. No greater love can we show in hazarding our lives to go out there and bring this gospel to the four corners of the earth. It says, and not suffer sin upon him. It says, rebuke him, rebuke your neighbor. And that's what we were doing out there, rebuking them. It says, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that's what we're doing. We are commanded to rebuke them and bring this gospel. All right. Isaiah 59 tells us we must go out and cry loud and spare not and show the people their transgressions. This is what we're commanded to do, brothers and sisters. Not sit behind and be keyboard warriors, 
not trying to gather people together in my house. And, and listen, you start that way, but there's a bigger calling. By your fruits, you shall know them. And it's shame on you if you can't see that for what it is. The scriptures are powerful and the scriptures will convince you and persuade you. And just like we read in Isaiah 43 and 9, it says, if you can't gainsay that, if you can't bring forth your judgment to justify your actions on that, it says, then you just have to be quiet and say, hey, it's truth. What they're doing is truth. But their spirit's not set up that way. So you get all types of other stuff that comes out of that, right? John 12 and 49. John chapter 12 and verse 49. Christ says, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me. And this is not for us to be, to, to, to be think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We must be humble and understand that even though, man, with, with this understanding that, that these scriptures make us gods, this understanding that we bring out makes us gods. The scripture says, it's not us speaking. It's because even Christ said it. He said, Christ said, I'm not speaking of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself and rebuke thy neighbor. And we are going to do what Christ did because that's what Christ did and expound and give better understanding on the scriptures. And he said what I should say and what I should speak. Christ was ordained and had orders of exactly what he should say and exactly what he should speak. Not of himself, not of things creeping in, of other doctrines and heresies. He said of him, of what his father commanded him that he should say and that he should speak. Verse 50, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. We know that orders that come from the top, from the most high, life everlasting is behind that. You want to follow after men. You want to follow after denominations. You want to follow after people losing their mind over, over nonsense. It says, and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak thereof, even as the father said unto me, so I speak understand that all words that come out when we go out there, it is the words of the Lord. That's the power and authority. That's what makes us like gods, not our own speech, not our own thoughts. It says the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says from within comes things that defile us. We go out and we speak God's words because we're commanded to do that. Even Christ did that. He had orders and a mission and he stuck to it perfectly. That's why you'll read in the scripture sometimes, it says Christ did this so that this, what I was said of him can be fulfilled. He did this so that this can be fulfilled. You read that in the gospels. And it says, and this happened so that this prophecy can be fulfilled because it was all set up. It was all ordered and structured and ordered to write the way it needed to be. Back to Isaiah 43 and 10 real quick. Isaiah 43 and 10 says, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So we went over how we were chosen. Right. It says that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed and neither should there be after me. We know and believe because prophecy is being fulfilled, fulfilled before your eyes. This is how we know and believe. This is what it's saying in this one verse. All this is being said. That we out there preaching this gospel, right, with our feet shod with the gospel of peace. Like it tells you in Ephesians, ready to go forth. Man, the men were suited and booted and ready to go out to bring this gospel. It says that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. It is only by the spirit of God that so many men can come together from different backgrounds, from different demons and devils that we had on us and be unified with purpose and one mission. You know, I said on the round table discussion that we were having, man, I felt like I was back in Esau's military because that's one thing I did like was that camaraderie. They, they call it the spirit, the core. Man, you felt that unity and that bond with the brothers. You know, brothers talking about, oh, it was an honor to go with you. And I'm like, man, it was an honor to just be with you. I know what you came out of, depending on who it was. I know what lifestyle you came out of. It was an honor to have you here supporting me. It was an honor for me to understand that, listen, I felt confident with the men that were around me because I saw it in their eyes, man. It, it was a, I mean, some of y'all, y'all see it, you know, the video, they're going to do the video with the slow-mo effects and, and people's faces hard and, you know, if adamant, like, you know, Flint just kind of walking. But to be there, man, and you just felt that energy and the way we were moving forward is powerful. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 1.17. This is what was being fulfilled out there as well. 
1 Corinthians 1, 17. It says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, don't get confused and fall off the boat. We're talking about within this, not the washing of water, right? The baptism is repentance and the faith of Christ. This is but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, right? We read earlier how even Christ said he didn't speak what he speak, wanted to speak. He spoke what God ordained him to. And this is what we did as we went out there. And he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. It says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Like we read in Isaiah 43 and 9, it says they're, they're either going to bring forth their cause and justify it or hear it and say it's truth. It says to them that perish, to them that are reserved for judgment, it's foolishness, right? But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. It's the power, like we read in Isaiah 41, that would makes us gods because we can talk about the former and the future, what's to come and what was and why it happened and what we must do to get out of it. It says, those who scoff, those who see the power. This is what it's speaking of. Verse 19, it says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudence. It's talking about worldly, carnally. The wisdom of the wise. Listen, Roman Catholicism was, was a masterful plan by the heathen to subdue our people. Christianity as a religion, and it starts with Roman Catholicism, was a masterful plan to destroy our people's minds. It says they were prudent in doing it. They were careful, right? Just like they understood in Judah 5, where it says, if we keep the laws, God's for us and no one can stand against us. But if we don't, they can come against us. They were prudent in how they set this up. So it's talking about worldly. It says, listen, it's written. And we were reading this. We're reading this in Isaiah. We read this all throughout the scriptures. It says, God will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The disputer of this world is their witnesses that you read in Isaiah 43 and 9. It says, where's this person? Right? And it's a joke. This is rhetorical. There isn't. We understand that, that there isn't. We read that in Isaiah 41. There is no disputer. There is no wise. Where's their scribe? There is no disputer. God made foolish the wisdom of this world. God, by his power and authority, makes foolish the stupid things that come out with their understanding on science, oppositions of it. I'm not saying all science is bad. Scripture also tells us honor the physician, but I'm going to expound upon that in a moment. It says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It says, the world by wisdom, by the world's wisdom, by science, false religions, everything else, they didn't really know God. It says, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The power of preaching should never be taken for granted. And you see it. The people were astonished. They marveled at what they saw and how we taught with authority and were able to bring it out and prove it with the scriptures. Literally, I mean, mouths open, eyes wide as they heard us and received it. And, were, and, and, and they gave their information and they want to learn more and they want to do more. Let me take some flyers for my, we ran out of flyers every day. Every day, before we were done, flyers were, flyers were good. Stuff for us to learn from. And we had a lot of flyers. I think it was like 22, 25,000 flyers for the trip. I think we need double next time. We ran out of flyers every day while we were out there because people wanted more. And nothing was on the floor. Not a one was tossed to the ground. They, they took it like it was the treasure that it is with the information that's in there. All right? The foolishness of preaching to save them that believe them that hear it and say it's truth. These are the witnesses that we are and what we saw. Watch this. Give me Wisdom of Solomon 13 and 1. I want to talk about this wisdom of the world and the foolishness of preaching. I should have enough time. I'll see. Lord's will. Uh, 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 wisdom of Solomon 13. And I thought this class would be quicker than what it is. Uh, wisdom of Solomon 13 and 1. It says, surely vain are all men by nature who are ignorant of God. So when it talks about their wise and their prudent, it says, you got to understand something. All men are vain by nature. They are ignorant of God. This is why it says the world by wisdom knew, knew not God and could not out of the good things that are seen, meaning all the creation and everything that's around, know him that is, neither by considering the works that they acknowledge the work master. So they'll see the planets, they'll see the stars, they see the ocean, they see the abundance of the creation, and they don't credit it to the most high. 
They talk about the Big Bang Theory. They talk about what they can do with their hands and what they bring forth, all right? It says, but deemed either fire or wind or the swift air or the circle of the stars or the violent water or the lights of heaven to be the gods which govern the world. And in those uh, ancient times, in those former times, they ascribed them to gods. And this is where you had the god of thunder, the god of the ocean, the god of this, that, and the other. Now their gods, you bring this up to modern times, is science and their trust in man-made things. There was younger brothers and sisters that were there that they say they had a belief in God as we traveled, but there was no scriptural basis. They didn't know scriptures. You know how sometimes you go to somebody and like, yeah, I know the scripture says this, I say that. They had zero understanding of scripture. So that's another effect that we had on them with the foolishness of preaching. To show them with the authority that we were teaching these scriptures and bring it out. A lot of these young minds that, that had soured on that were actually revitalized. Their spirit was rejuvenated by what was brought out. First Timothy 6 and 20, we're going to come back to wisdom, all right? First Timothy 6 and 20, understand the gods today is dealing with those science, but I want to, I want to be specific in this, right? It says, first Timothy 6 and 20 says, oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, these laws, statutes, and commandments, this power that makes us gods, right? Because for the other nations, what makes them gods is science, right? Things like the nuclear bomb, the medicines, this, that, and all this other stuff. It, it makes us see them as God and the things that they do. Sending men to space, down to the depths of the ocean, right? We understand, based on the scriptures, we're the gods because of what we're able to do. We're, we're, we're able to fulfill prophecy, see prophecy, tell the former things, tell the things to come. It says, uh, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. This is the vanity that they have that we read of. It says man by his nature inherently is vain. It says, and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Oppositions means something opposing to. And what this simply means, brothers and sisters, when it comes to science, is that if the science opposes what the scriptures say, then that's the science that you don't agree with. That's the science that is falsely so-called. So I, I need to impress upon this because some people go nuts and they say there's no value in, in certain understanding, not understanding. And as we read on a wisdom, you understand. Uh, I've often said, as I went to school and I was in college and you know chemistry, science, different classes, it didn't make me believe in God less. It made me believe in him more. And it's because I was able to, by his spirit, to be able to see the things that he put into creation for our uses and give credit and honor to him. And those of us who have any understanding of that stuff. So if you're going to be a doctor or whatever it might be is, is by his grace that he gives that, but we still give honor to him for putting these things in place for us to utilize it the way we use. Right. Just like he gave us, you know, the animals for our service and the field and the crops and everything else. All right. But when it comes to science, the problem with science is when it's oppositions of it meaning what? Opposed to these scriptures. So when the opposition is contrary to the scripture, then you don't believe that science, right? So we must give credit to the creator in all things. Let's go back to wisdom of Solomon. I'll read verse uh, chapter 13, verse two again. It says, but deemed I the fire or wind or the swift air or the circle of the stars or the violent water or the lights of heaven to be the gods which govern the world. That time, again, physical gods, Thor, Zeus, uh, Poseidon, uh, you know, whatever, Loki, all the different ones, right? This time we know science. I want you to think about this now in this day. With whose beauty, if they being delighted, took them to be gods. Oh, look at that star. Oh, look, the sun is so beautiful. There must be a God that, that, that dwells there. It says, let them know how much better the Lord of them is. Don't be so in awe of these things that it makes you put the science, it makes you put the stuff ahead of the Lord. It says, how much greater is the Lord of them? Understanding that God created these things. For the first author of beauty have created them. He is the first author of beauty. So all the creation is actually testament to the Lord. That's how we should look at it. It says, but if they were astonished at their power and virtue, let them understand by them how much mightier he is that made them. And it says, you should be astonished. You should be in awe of the power of the creation that's there, but never lose sight of what's behind it. This is what I said when I took these classes. It made me appreciate the most high more, not less, because I was astounded, all right, by the virtue and the power of him that made them. 
It says, for by the greatness and beauty of the creatures, proportionably, the maker of them is seen. God is seen in the creation. God is seen in all that. And, and I'm going to tie this all back into the witnesses and what we're bringing forth, all right? Because we're going into that foolishness of preaching and what was put forth in that. Because now we're talking about creation, but the power of, of, a, of somebody who came out of all different walks of life and what we're doing now as a body and what we did on this quest, again, shows how the most high moves and how that increases faith, right? So through creation, this is telling you, we see God. Through the creation, we see God. And we say, gosh, my gosh, this is, you know, Esau talks about, I saw a quote by Isaac Newton one time, and it says, uh, they call gravity, gravity, that's the term they use for it, right? And Isaac Newton said, uh, you know, gravity, right, explains, you know, you know, how the planets are in motion and how they stay there and hold, right? In, in, in small terms, in, in, in our small minds, because our thoughts are not his, they found a way to articulate how you explain how the planets kind of stay there without any strings or anything being held up. But he says, what it doesn't explain is who set those planets in motion. What it doesn't explain is the, is the different aspects of the creation. Hey, you know something? I'm not saying it's official. Maybe it was a big bang, but then who did it? Maybe that was the most high clapping his hands and creating what he created, right? But there was a divine order and structure in how he did it. And the creation, right, and explanations that we put to make it small, because it's so magnificent that we make it small by assigning numbers, by assigning words to it, so that we can kind of wrap our head around it. But you should see the power of the most high behind that. Same thing, when I remember what I'm saying, when I go back and I make the example as to these men that were out there teaching, right? I'm going to finish this up. Verse six, it says, but yet for this day, they are less to be blamed for they peradventure err, seeking God and desireth to find him. He says, so these people who marvel at this, who call other things gods, who call science and other things before that God, it says, then shouldn't be blamed that much because what is really behind that is their spirit is seeking God. And they desire to find them. It's like our people that have a zeal of the Lord, but not according to knowledge. He says, for being conversant in his works, they search him diligently and believe their sight because the things are beautiful that are seen. So creation is amazing. It's incredible. So, of course, you can't be blamed for seeing your sight and being enamored by what was created. The most high is perfect. And what he made was magnificent. He says, how be it, neither are they to be pardoned, even though. So he's almost saying, ah, you kind of can't blame them. But he says, but they shouldn't be pardoned for that. He says, but if they were able to know so much with all this science and everything else that they could aim at the world, how did they not sooner find out the Lord thereof? With all that wisdom, this is why I say the world by wisdom knew not God when you read in 1 Corinthians, because as smart as they may be, as much as they may philosophize and bring things out, it says if they were that smart, how could they not see the power of the Lord behind those things that created it, right? And it says, but miserable are they, and in dead things is their hope, who called them gods, which are the works of men's hands. It says, miserable are those people because they can never see what we can see by the foolishness of preaching those that are meant to hear it, who are called, who are called to be those witnesses of the Most High. That's the magnificent. They can't see those things. It says, so that's why it says by the foolishness of preaching. So here it says, who called them gods, which are the works of men's hands, gold and silver to show art in and resemblance of beasts or stone good for nothing. The work of an ancient hand. And this was going into the idolatry. Today, they do it with science where they try to create things. They say, we know the chemical structure of this cloning, different things like that. That's the work of man's hands. All right. So let's go back to first Corinthians. All right, and I want to read uh, verse 21 again to, to, to expound and bring you back into why I went to wisdom, all right? Uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The wisdom of God is all that creation. Everything that God created, they use to put their, their science and, their for, and, and, and eliminate what they believe is eliminate a reason for God. We got the explanation for everything, all right? It says... The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The power in what we've done and what we continue to do as we go out there, boots on the ground, a purple t-shirt, black pants and black boots, some signs drawn up, and my Bible. 
all you need is your Bible. My bag was light on that trip. I had my Bible, some hand sanitizer. <laughs> I had my Bible and my Apocrypha. And that was it. That's what I brought out with me. And that's all I needed. Yeah, we brothers had camp signs. Yeah, we had speakers. Guess what? Speakers die, we speak. We lift up the voice like a trumpet. All you need is your sword. And you go out there because we are made mightier by that foolishness of preaching. I want to jump to verse 26. It says, for you see your calling, brethren, right? Those of you that are called, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God have chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. This was the astonishment that they had. They would think that we were in schools of theology and everything, the way this word came out strong. All right. And God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty from a worldly sense, because we know we're not weak. We read earlier that because we bring these things out and can bring out this uh, confounding of the world's wisdom, that we're gods, but to them it's weak. And, and, and the comments and the side things that we got as we were coming off the boat, on the boat, people looking at us, checking our fringes. It says, and base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And this is what we witnessed. This is what we saw. Those of us there firsthand and those of you watching it online. Second Corinthians 2 and 4. I'm going to try to get through the rest of this uh, a little quick. Second Corinthians 2 and 4. It says, uh, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears that you Oh, no, you know what? I don't think it was second. My apologies. I think it was first. Let me just make sure. See? Ugh. Me watching the clock. What's my place? Let me make sure that's what I wanted. Bear with me, brothers and sisters. First Corinthians. Make sure that's what I wanted. Ah, it's first Corinthians two. I apologize. First Corinthians two and four. It says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words or man's wisdom. This was the foolishness of preaching that we went out with out there. All right. But in demonstration of the spirit and of the power. And they saw this. This is what I want to impress upon you. I mean, it was something that you, it's almost like you had to be there. All right. But again, I said, this is my thoughts on the quest and, and the witnesses that we were and the blessing that that was for us to witness this. And it says, it was not with enticing words of man's wisdom that we went out there. It was with the foolishness of preaching with God's words, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Just us being unified and walking out there. I said, that was a demonstration of power and they saw it. And you want to know what was behind those side remarks and everything else from other nations as we went off them ships? It was really their fear of what they saw, of this exceeding great army being unified. They, they, they want to see us uh, in debauchery, in drinking, in revelings, in smoking weed, and, and fighting. That makes them comfortable. Uncomfortable is what they saw. Uncomfortable is this foolishness of preaching and the conviction of us going to do that. While they wanted to be there sipping Mai Tais and Pina Coladas on the beach, and they thought to see us doing that, they saw us marching forth deeper into the countries that we were going to, to bring forth this message to our people. It says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's what we went out there to show, that our faith does not stand in the wisdom of men, but the power of God of seeing these Proverbs and these bywords going out there and bringing this word to the people. Acts 4 and 13. Acts 4 and 13. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And the heathen marveled and our people marveled. Acts of the apostles. Because we believe that we're ignorant and unlearned and we are not. The scripture told us that we're gods because we use these scriptures to bring this stuff out. It says, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And these people said, these are men. We hear it all, all the time. These are men of the Lord. We know the Lord is with you because they marvel, because they see what's seen as the base things, as the small things, as, as, as the foolish things. And they said, these men speak with authority and power. 
the people marveled at what we brought out. Let's go back to Isaiah 43 and 10 again. Isaiah 43 and 10. You're my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. This is that faith. This is what we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and 5, that it didn't stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, that we may know and believe me. He chose men to be witnesses first, called first, to go forth and bring that. Because as a witness, you must now justify your cause, bring forth your cause, your strong reason. Talk about the former things and the things to come. And it says, and that we be, and understand that I am he. We magnified the power of God, not ourselves. Before me, there was no God form, neither should there be after me. Matthew 7 and 28. Kind of almost done. Matthew 7 and 28. Matthew 7, verse 28. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. I've witnessed all this. On, and I'm telling you, other brothers and sisters can bear witness as well. Those men that were with us in the battle, they saw this same thing. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. They're used to seeing pastors soft and delicate and gentle. We spoke with authority because we were filled with the spirit of the Lord. And we stand bold and believe. They saw belief because you want to know something? Their pastors don't even really believe what they shovel in. They don't, but to go and they saw men, they know that the, that the Lord had visited them through the messengers that we, that we are. And it says they were astonished, the people, at the doctrine, because we taught them with authority and not as what they'd seen up until that point. Isaiah 43 again. I'm going to jump to verse 18. Isaiah 43, 18. It says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You are witnessing the new thing today in this earth and what you see in the men that go forth that have been called to be witnesses first to go forth and bring this out, to set an example, to be the vanguard so those that come after to do the same thing and have the same convictions and power and authority that we have in these scriptures. It says, the beast of the field shall honor me the dragons and the isles, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. We are the manifestation of these scriptures and what we did just now on that quest and what we will continue to do as we travel, to give water, to give drink, because they're in that wilderness, they're in a deserted place with no hope. And we brought them hope and a message of hope. And we cannot leave them hopeless. And we must continue to go back and continue to bang on. This is where we need the support. Like, share, spread this word. We have the booster club. We have different means. Understand that men are not out there chilling, all right? Desiring Ferraris and all that type of other stuff. We out there desiring to bring this strong drink of the word, to bring this food to our people because they were thirsty. And you saw it. And they were astonished and they saw the power that we brought it with. It says, this people have I formed for myself. They shall, for, for, they shall show forth my praise. God ordained that this people, and he made them for himself so that we, and you know how we show forth his praise? By bringing this word out like we did. Stay in Isaiah 44, jump to verse, uh, chapter 44, I want verse 1. It says, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. And this is what we did. We went out there, and what we will continue to do is pour water upon all those brothers and sisters that are scattered to the four corners, and they thirsty, and they received it. You know what it is to offer something to somebody? You know that satisfaction, maybe those of you who host and like, you know, it's a good meal or whatever it is. You feel good when somebody enjoyed it and they took it in. This is what we saw. This is the thing that inspired us. It came to the scriptures, right? It says, for I poured water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. This is why we must continue it on. It says, and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. You're going to see these sanctuaries spring up wherever we've touched, to be the Lord's will. 
One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by my name. These brothers and sisters that are going there, just like we once did, that they, they had their names that were subscribed to them. They had their names of their conquistadors. You're going to see this in examples throughout the four corners of the earth. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer of the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Is God moving in what you saw? All honor and glory and all praises to him, not us that we went and did it. We were just the vessels that he used. But the example is there. We are his witnesses. We are his servants that were called to do that. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set an order for me since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. That's what we did. The things that are coming and the things that shall come, we showed it unto these people. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Only this God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes, it's only by his power and authority can what we do and what we've done be accomplished and what you witnessed. Watch this, Jeremiah 3.15. Moving a little fast because I want to get through it. I'm almost done. I got maybe five, six more scriptures. Jeremiah 3.15. It says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Prophecy being fulfilled. Witnesses of the Lord being made manifest in the earth today. It's high time that we step it up in gear. That purge, that thing is done. Now it's time for the surge. And we're going to move forward and continue to fulfill this prophecy that the scripture speaks about. See it, believe it for what it is, because it's right here before your eyes. You blind with eyes, you deaf with ears, listen it and understand what's being done. Isaiah 62 and 6. Back to Isaiah 62 and 6. Isaiah 62 and 6. It says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. We will not hold our peace. We will continue to push this truth further and further into the ends of the earth where our people are. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. We're commanded to not keep silence and to continue to prophesy and give him no rest. We will not give them rest. We will continue to bang on these scriptures and bring forth what needs to come out till he establish and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth because we are not yet a praise in the earth. We will not rest. We will continue because we have orders. We have orders that will not cease until we see the king return. So the skies crack and he comes in that V formation with the host of heaven behind him and that we get that satisfaction and wisdom of Solomon that all these heathen that dare to speak against us and this time because this is their kingdom will say these are them that we sometimes had in derision, right? Jump to verse 10, same chapter, verse 10. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people, lift up this Bible, this is what we're commanded. This is what we witnessed, all right? Behold, the Lord have proclaimed unto the end of the world. This is why we must go to all these places. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, behold, thy salvation cometh. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people. And we went there and we said, you're not spicks. You're not the low things of the earth. You are God's holy people the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. You are not abandoned. You are not forsaken. This is the gospel of peace that we brought to the people. Our feet shod with that message to bring that out there. Jeremiah 50 and 2. Jeremiah 50 and 2. Declare ye among the nations, just like we read earlier, Christ said, go into the whole world, go into all nations. Isaiah said, bring forth the nations assembled. Declare ye among the nations and publish and yet set up a standard. Publish and conceal not. Say Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded. Marat is broken into pieces. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. Deacons and bishops spoke of a reason we were called first to teach this. This is what, when we were there on the class, this is the stuff that they were, they were, they were bringing out that, that, that sense for us to realize the magnitude of what we had just accomplished. It's not a light thing. 
And like I said, I've been thinking about it since since that since Friday and Saturday. It's been in my head, in my head. And and I took this opportunity to bring this out here. Watch this. Watch, watch, watch. Acts one and six. We were called first to teach this, and it's an honor. I mean, it's an honor. So yes, when brothers and sisters saying it was an honor that I did this with you, it was an honor for me to be amongst all those brothers and sisters that were there. And it says, Acts 1 and 6 says, when they were therefore come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, would thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Right, this is after Christ resurrected. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. We don't know when that's gonna come, but we know the scripture says, do not cease. He says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is what it means to be a witness. A witness doesn't sit there and say, oh, I love Christ, I love God, here's Jesus. A witness goes out into all the world. It says, we are going to be witnesses. It says, we're gonna receive power after the Holy Ghost. This is the power where the scripture in Isaiah said, we are gods by bringing this understanding out, the former and what's to come. And it says, and we keep these laws in the Holy Ghost. It says, and power has come upon us. And that power is what? That we shall be witnesses unto the most high in Christ in Jerusalem, in Judea, meaning to Southern kingdom, to Northern kingdom, and in all and unto the uttermost part of the earth. to so the furthest reaches where you might not think where we ever going to go, the most high is going to show a way and provide a path for us to get there and bring forth this word. Isaiah 49 and 1. Three more scriptures, Isaiah 49 and 1. Isaiah 49 and 1. Listen, O isles, unto me. We were over here in the different islands. And hearken, ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother have he made mention of my name. Make no mistake about it. Whether it's for a dispensation of time or forever until we reign in the kingdom of heaven, each and every one of us that our feet is shod with this gospel to go and preach, we were called to do that. We were called to be his witnesses from the womb. He had made mention of my name. God, the creator of all this magnificence that we read in Wisdom of Solomon 13, called you brothers, called you sisters in your own way with different ministry to bring forth this. And he had made my mouth like a sharp sword. And in the shadow of his hand have he, have he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver have he hid me. The changes that we make to bring this forth, it's marvelous. It's only the Lord that can do something like that. And said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Because when we realize and the power of the Holy Ghost come upon us, we're like, damn, what was I doing all my life? How could I have never seen this? And he says, but and now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. That's what we've been called to do. The glory and honor of witnesses to bring Jacob again to the most high. He says, thou Israel, be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. We won't be gathered in one city, in one country. He says, but we will still be that glory. We will be that foolish thing that will confound the wise. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles or people who don't know that are scattered everywhere that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. This is why we have to push further and further and go on mission and have this ministry and move further. And, and this was the witness of what we saw and the witnesses that were there on the quest. And, we, and it started with that, what was it? Four countries in, in, in seven days or something like that? Four countries. And even more, when you think of the mediums that went out, the radio shows that broadcast to neighboring countries, the camps, how those flyers and everything will reverberate through. God said, guess what? As marvelous as this is, it's a light thing. But I called you and you were called to be a witness from the womb. Sirach 47 and 13. Sirach 47 and 13. Now this is speaking about Solomon specifically, but I want to make a point, the similarities in the abundance of wisdom, because when Solomon took power, right, he prayed for wisdom and the Most High said he made him the wisest. 
You're seeing an increase and an abundance in that wisdom now in these times, but not through one man, but through the body, right? That is us, that is here at IUIC through the body and through the spirit of Christ, right? So it says, Solomon reigned in a peaceable time and was honored. For God made all quiet round about him, that he might build a house in his name and prepare his sanctuary forever. And though we live in tumultuous times, though we see signs of the last days, the most high for now, we're not being yet cast into prison houses. We're not being uh, uh, teaching upon pain of death. Those greater tribulations have not come yet. So the, the medium of the internet, the medium to be able to use cruise ships and, and have the ability to preach this gospel this way, that's of the Lord. Just like he made a peace for Solomon to be able to magnify Israel's wisdom, we now in these last days have a peaceful time. When I say peaceful, uh, irrespective of what's going on in the nations and, and other stuff, but peaceful enough that we're able to travel to these other countries and preach this gospel because they don't have the same freedoms in a lot of these places that we have here. But the similarities are striking. And it says, how wise was thou in thy youth? And as a flood filled with understanding, the knowledge in these scriptures that we have today and what our purpose is and what our mission is, is flowing through the spirit of the Most High Christ, through the body and through all the members and what we do here, right? And it says, thy soul covered the whole earth and thou fillest it with dark parables. These deep understandings are starting to be known and we're able to break this down in all the corners of the earth. Thy name went far unto the islands and for thy peace thou was beloved. And I'm telling the people like, well, no, don't leave. Are you coming back? When can we see you again? Because why? That peace, that peace of the gospel, that message that we taught with authority. It says that the countries marvel at thee for thy songs and proverbs and parables and interpretations. Just like when Solomon was in power, you're seeing striking similarities to what we're doing today with these scriptures. These countries are marveling at us. We have mayors and presidents of some of these countries that want us to be there and speak. You saw that, I, I think it was Ghana, all right? They met with some uh, 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 representative, I think it was the president, right? It says, thou by the name of the Lord God, which is called the Lord God of Israel, thou didst gather gold as tin and didst multiply silver as lead. And this is what we're doing. The gold and the silver is talking about men, right? Because the scripture says he will make a man better than the fine gold of Ophir, right? That's a precept for that. He says, we, with this power and authority and with this wisdom, and during this time that he's given us space to bring this word out, he says, we're going to gather gold as tin. What does he mean? Tin is abundant. Gold is not. He said, so we're going to grab what the world doesn't see as gold, what the world doesn't see as silver. He says, we are going to reap it as tin and as, and as lead. There's an abundance of tin and lead in the world. Gold and silver, they're more precious, right? There's less of it, or so they think. The gold and the silver is you, brothers and sisters, as we go out and we show forth the example through repentance and with this power that we receive by the Holy Ghost. Now, last scripture, 2 Corinthians 2.14. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. And I say this because the trip was incredible. Uh, I'm not even talking about the unity, the other stuff that we did while we, you know, we were on the ship and, you know, having dinner together and, and whatnot. But the power of how we went out and what we did, I mean, it was, it was marvelous. Um, if you have the opportunity to go, go do it. Um, especially you men that have a measure or dispensation of understanding. Uh, trust me, there's a place and a purpose for everybody, man. I mean, you know, even brothers that just, I'm telling you, I saw brothers, I mean, bold and happy. They didn't understand a lick of what was coming out, man. And them brothers were there like, like engaged because they saw it. They saw the power and they saw the result in the people. But I got to say, we got to give all praises. Thanks be to God. All praises because 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ because we certainly got the victory. All praises to the Most High in Christ, because we got the victory in Christ and make of manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. He makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us, by us. All praises by us in every place in the world where our people are scattered to bring forth this gospel. All right. I pray y'all get some understanding. I pray this class helps you establish your faith more. All right. Stay in the spirit. Make sure it's a blessed day. And uh, let's pray for the hastening of the Sabbath to come. All right. All praise to the Most High in Christ. Shalom, Israel.